Okay, I see that everybody's joining. So I will already start with a short introduction before we get truly started with our speaker of today. So my name is Annelies van Dijk. Uh, I am the project manager of the Psychom Academy at Saimingo. Uh, and I want to welcome you all here in the first launch talk of the new year. And I also want to wish you all uh, the best for the new year with a lot of success in your research or in your projects from me, but also from the entire Saimingo team. And for the people who do not know us, because today we are joined with a lot of people, uh, I will short, shortly introduce ourselves. Um, so Saimingo is a Flemish nonprofit organization located here in Brussels, in Belgium. And we want to help researchers and science communicators to reach out to a broader audience. And specifically with our Psychom Academy, we offer on one hand dedicated in-person trainings here in Brussels, uh, to help you communicate using different platforms. For example, um, using social media or a short video pitch of a few minutes uh, using a presentation on stage or even a podcast. Um, on the other hand, we also organize these free monthly lunch talks uh, like the one of today, where experts in science or science communication come to share their tips and tricks about a variety of topics. Um, we had lectures about how to write a book as a scientist, but also more interactive panels discussions on uh, how can we make science more fun for children. And with the new year, we are also very excited, of course, to announce the kickoff of our new spring season. And you can discover all of our trainings yourself by scanning this QR code. It will take you directly to the different courses we are uh, organizing today. Uh, this this uh, season, I'm sorry. And um, on the other hand, you can also sus subscribe to our newsletter by scanning the other QR codes, and then you will stay up to date by the different lunch talks we're organizing or other initiatives of our organization. Um, I can already inform you about our next lunch talk, which will be organized on February 22. And it will be a co-hosted lunch talk with the Belgian Women in Science Organization, or BWISE. And this is in light of the International Day for Women and Girls in Science. And then we will talk about um, the gender data gap and also the gender differences in research. So uh, I will link more information about this lunch talk in the follow-up mail. So I think for now, a lot of people have joined. So I think it's time to introduce our speaker of today. And that is Pedro de Brekere. Uh, hello, Pedro. Uh, Pedro is a real mythbuster, I can say. Uh, he's been fighting urban myths about learning and education for a long time now. And today in our lunch talk, Pedro will discuss what makes actual good science and how can we identify it. But also why do people still too often fall for urban myths? And yes, also a scientist can be considered human. Um, and also what can or should we do to fight these misconceptions? But why can it sometimes be dangerous to bust these myths? So this is a bit a teaser for what we'll follow in a couple hour or a bit less than an hour. And before I give the floor to Pedro, I just want to encourage all of you to ask your questions in the Q&A window. Uh, and we will have time at the end of the talk to tackle as many of many as possible of them. Um, and with that, uh, with that said, Pedro, the floor is all yours. And I wish you all a very pleasant and informative talk. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm opening my slide deck now so you can see me. Hi, my name is Pedro de Bruyker. I'm an educational scientist, but first of all, I became a teacher of uh, Dutch history and geography. And then I became an educational scientist. And if you have any complaints about me, you can put them in uh, the Q&A, of course. You can put them in the chat. You can also, if you're still on Twitter, yeah, I resist uh, the urge to call it X. You can uh, point, uh, complain also about me on uh, Twitter with the band B or any other platform. This is uh, the website that I'm having. It will be also, also shared afterwards the slides too by the way and this is the book that started a lot of the things that i will discuss in this talk urban myths about learning education one thing that we didn't expect was that as a result of this book paul casper and, I, and myself would receive so many other questions that we had to write a second book more urban myths 
yeah, that title took a lot of effort. And this is the most recent book, The Psychology of Great Teaching. Um, and I'll end explaining this book by the end of my talk because it's not a myth book as such anymore. And that has a very peculiar reason. Okay. Now, the question that I received to discuss in this talk was, why do people believe false scientific claims? And to explain this, I first want to do a couple of experiments with you and on you. It's not approved by an ethical committee, sorry. Uh, you can say I'm not doing it, but please indulge me. Um, I want to make you meet Linda. I want to introduce Linda. Linda is 32 years old, is um, working in, uh, no, has studied philosophy in Leuven and is a big fan of poetry. Okay, so do you see Linda, 32 years old, studied uh, philosophy in Leuven and is a big fan of poetry. Now I have two options for you. Option, option A is Linda, 32, studied philosophy in Leuven, really digs poetry, works in a bank. Or option B, Linda, 30 year, 32 years old, studied philosophy, really loves poetry, works in a bank, and is also activistic, defending women's rights. Women rights. Okay. Now, who says you can put on... Uh, you can put your hand up, your digital hand up, because I can't see you. Who says option A is the most most logical one? Linda, 32, philosophy, poetry, works in the bank. Let's see who is putting up their hand. Okay. Who says no, option B is correct. Linda, 32 years old, works in the bank but also is an activist for women's rights. Oh, much more people are now raising their hands and it's incorrect. Because if you take the whole group of Lindas who are 33 years old and who really like poetry and studied philosophy, who are working in a band, only a small portion of them will also be an activist for women's rights. But based on three elements, you only received three elements. 32 years old, studied philosophy and liking poetry. You already knew, oh, I know Linda. She would never work in a bank if she doesn't fight for women's rights. Okay, that's the first little test. A second little experiment. And we will also use uh, the hands. Um, if you, I have a... a a list of numbers, a string of numbers in my head, and behind those numbers, there is a, a logic. If you have discovered the logic, you raise your hand when you see this smiley. If you're not sure yet, you will raise your hand with this smiley. Easy. Okay, I will introduce the first number of the list. Two. Who already knows the logic behind this list? Nobody. Who doesn't know the logic yet? Okay. And I've noticed that the hands are working. Okay. Moving on. The second number. Two, four. Who already knows the logic behind this? Some people, a very small group, who says, I'm not sure yet. Okay, the majority. Okay, moving on. Two, four, eight. Who says, yeah, now I get it. And a lot of people, but who doesn't trust me? Also, still some people. Okay, uh, I'll add a last number. So we had two, four, eight. The next number, 19. Who now already knows the logic behind this numbers. Oh, who doesn't know the logic, doesn't recognize the logic? That's strange because when I gave you eight, a lot of people said, I know it. And now a lot of people are not so sure anymore. I'll disclose the logic myself. 
it is more. Well, a lot of people already were thinking based on three numbers, oh, it's doubling probably. But that was not the case. It was just normal. Actually, uh, those two little experiments are based on the work of Daniel Kahneman, um, who is famous for behavioral e economics. And it's a little test on what we call the confirmation bias. And probably this is already one of the biggest reasons why we are intended to believe false claims. If that false claim relates to something we are already convinced of, it's much easier to say, oh, yeah, that's correct. And it's all about the power of convictions and beliefs. And Daniel Willingham described in his book, When, to Trust, when Can You Trust the Expert? Described two meta convictions, two basic convictions that are very popular in society. It's the Enlightenment versus Romanticism, or also science versus nature. And uh, this hair product didn't want to take any risk. So what they've done is they combined nature. You see the flowers and the leaves, but also do you see over whoop, there the, the little tubes? That's for trying to get both audiences. This, I'll translate it for the people who can't speak Dutch. This is an actual uh, advertisement. Molecules are the ingredient for another hair product, living proof. Yeah, I used to use a hair product without molecules. And uh, yeah, well, I won't show you, but it's awful what it's done to my hair. So they try to convince people to, by using scientific claims, but it's totally rubbish. Now, in education, I'm an educational scientist. Those two convictions are also very recognizable. For instance, the enlightened arguments, the scientific arguments, science is the best way to understand the world, and learning is based on universal laws that apply on any learner. Okay. But things can go wrong when you use enlightened arguments. And I want to share with, one of the, with you one of the very first urban myths in education that I examined it took a month of my life four weeks of my life and it's this one the learning pyramid just to be curious whoever saw this uh pyramid already on or in class or in uh on linkedin it's very popular on linkedin oh i see already some people raising their hands i feel your pain now um it's very easy what this learning pyramid says. Actually, it's a triangle, not a, py a pyramid, but who cares? Um, if I explain something to you, you will remember 5%. But if you explain it to me, then you will remember 90%. Okay. And for a lot of people, this looks scientific because you have percentages and often you have also references underneath we know it's true. No, we don't. Actually, after those four weeks examining this urban myth, I um, rebranded it as the Loch Ness Monster of Education because it keeps popping up, but nobody seems to know where it's coming from. Where does it come from? Who invented it? Well, I'll try to answer this question. Now, myth-busting and education, or myth-busting, is often not that difficult. It sounds bizarre, but, well, it's not that difficult to start with because the first thing we do is we check the references. And in this case, there are a lot. We have Dale. We have Bale. We have Glosser with one S. We have Glosser with double S. We have the National Training Laboratories in Bethlehem, Maine. If you reach out to those people in uh, Bethlehem, Maine, and you ask them, is this uh, pyramid your work? They will answer yes. But we've lost the study and we lost the data. And I know they're lying. By the way, Dales and Bales also uh, pops up as a reference. And he and colleagues also. But I know the only true answer. The shape. The shape of this pyramid is based on one of the oldest theory of on multimedia learning. Imagine in 19... 46, a man is sitting at his desk thinking about how can we use video or film in that time and sound recordings in the classroom. 
well, here in Europe, everything was devastated. Everything was broken because of the Second World War. But at that time, Edgar Dale came up with his cone of experience. This is a slightly older version from 1969. And this is the basis. But there is one thing missing. What's missing if you compare this to the learning pyramid? Well, the percentages. Because it was a theory. It was somebody sitting at his desk actually based on other theories, but not on actual research. Now, what is the oldest source for the percentages? Well, that took a lot of time. Um, the oldest source, the oldest reference we found was early last century, beginning of the 20th century, and totally made up. And in 1968-69, an HR manager of an Texan oil company, Exxon, combined the percentages that he found through a lieutenant of the American army with the shape of Edgar Dale and the learning pyramid was born. And if you want to know how we found all of this, I'll buy me a Coke sometime and I'll try to explain it, but it took a lot of effort. The first real study happened in 2007 by Lally and Miller. And actually, their conclusion was it's complete beep or also completely wrong. And actually, you should have known. We could have known. It was also the reason why I started examining those myths. Um, I was, I received a new textbook that we would use in our learning teaching uh, department, in our teaching training department. And the uh, pyramid was in the textbook. And I was wondering, how can students explain to me stuff that I know and they don't? But even more important, imagine, imagine this pyramid being correct. Then there is only one best way to teach any subject to any given student in any given context. Teacher training would only last one week. Preparing a class would say, oh, what will my students do tomorrow? Oh, I know. They'll explain it to me. I'm done. I don't think we would have a teacher shortage. Actually... That's great news because we now know one size does not fit all in education. Okay. Now, there are also romantic arguments. Intuition is a valid way to understand the world. The individual experience is the best way to understand the world. And nature has strong hidden powers and potential. A very popular myth is that we only use 10% of our brain. And that relates to that, long, uh, that last uh, argument we have hidden powers and potential. And I know that if you look to some of your colleagues that you are convinced that they only use 10% of their brain. I won't mention names, but we both know who I'm talking about. But still, they use their whole brain. Sorry for that. Now, for instance, this, ex this school um had a website i used it with my students but they changed the website um almost every single myth that we discussed in our first book was included as truth in this website and you see which um meta conviction they are using nature okay but i also have a sad example and and uh to show you how stubborn myths can be uh, I have to explain this because I don't think a lot of you are working in education, but we have had real reading wars. Reading wars on how to teach students the best way how to read. And actually, it's the same fight between two meta convictions. Phonics is the scientific conviction the enlightened conviction, and that's the way most of you have been taught how to read, where you have uh, cut up letters and you have to learn how to decode combinations of letters to translate them into sounds. Whole language is the way 
you as an adult read today. We don't read every single syllable separately. No, we see words and often we see even complete combinations of words. And so a lot of people said we from a kind of instinct read when we know how to read whole words, we need to teach our children that way how to read. And they made a, yeah, reading a kind of guessing game. Now, this has been an awful discussion because it's one of the things that has been replicated again and again and again. We've had several rounds of reading wars and what we know from all those reading wars is that the whole language approach doesn't work. Well, it works for some students, but for majority, it's not a great idea. And even worse, for children from a Boer background, it's uh, the worst way to teach them how to read. On the other hand, phonics is a good way. Still, after a couple of, after a decade or two decades, the discussion always pops up again. And uh, it was uh, five years ago, a great article by uh, Russell and Castle and a third person I always forget, sorry about that, ending the reading wars. And the result was, guess what? A new reading war. So we keep, even if the science is clear, we keep having the same discussion, a fight between those two meta convictions. Okay. Now, why, this was a kind of introduction, but why are those misconceptions so hard to battle? Because when we were working on uh, the second edition of the first book, we started wondering, yeah, but are we doing the right thing? And why are people believing those mis misconceptions? Well, yeah, of course, you have the example of the confirmation bias, but it's often even worse. Because falsification debunking can often strengthen a myth and why is this because this was for us well pretty bad news because repetition can strengthen a myth yes you can have convictions but also if you hear the same thing again and again and again well then it's easier to believe it but what is the thing when you start debunking? To debunk it, to debunk a myth, then you also have to repeat the myth. But the people will hear the myth more often than the debunking. So a result can be that by debunking the myth, people do hear the myth, do hear the debunking, but forget debunking a short while after they've read the debunking. So then you made things worse. Bye. No, I have to move on. Um, also, cultural factors can strengthen myths. Uh, some uh, traditions, some uh, elements that have been the case for a long time in education, for instance, but in a lot of places, places can actually um, strengthen those convictions, can strengthen those um, repetitions also, and making myths more popular. And, oh yeah, bad news always sells. So, for instance, the idea that education is in trouble in, uh, the, edu in the case for um, myths, uh, urban myths about education and learning, if you can show you education is in trouble and you have a solution, people will often believe you. And then you get the dangers of educational science, of edu science. Now, three things that I want to discuss here, uh, maybe for some, something you already know, but first I will discuss scientists versus gurus. The second element, scientists are human too. And number three, evidence-based cherry picking. Okay, first, scientists versus gurus. A scientist will always say, I, or most often, because we now most often work in teams, we think. It's the current knowledge. 
versus gurus who say, I know. And for people who are experiencing an issue, a problem, oh, my students are having trouble reading, then I know is much more convincing often than we think. Scientists are often having a discussion versus gurus. Well, they know for sure. And the other people are just stupid. And if you see typical science of pseudoscience, pseudoscience like exaggerated claims, overlines on anecdotes, um, the absence of connectiv connectivity to other research, no review by other scholars, lack of self-correction when contrary exp exp evidence is published. For instance, um, in our second book, we discuss the concept of growth mindset. That's uh, a, a popular idea that if you think that you still can learn, that uh, you don't have the fixed mindset, I'm stupid or I'm smart, that you will learn more. This was coined by Carol Dweck. Now, Carol Dweck is a real scientist. It's not a guru. Now, a lot of people have taken her concept to a level that she acknowledged that's not what I've said. Now, we know since 2018, by a lot of studies, replication studies, but also uh, a huge meta-analysis, that the effect of working on uh, a growth mindset doesn't have too much effect on average. What for me is showing that Carol Dweck is a real scientist, a true scientist, is that she even was one of the researchers in the huge replication study showing that the effect was small. Also changing her opinion for a bit. So that's lack of self-correction. Carol Dweck did do self-correction. Um, psychobabble always helps. And talk of proof instead of evidence. In mathematics, you have proof. In science, we, and for sure, in human science, we have evidence. This could be the case. But sometimes scientists trying to sell their idea or to sell their uh, research are acting like gurus. Um, I want to give you this example. Um, Howard Gardner is also very famous for his uh, research, or no, his theory, I have to correct myself, his theory on uh, multiple intelligences. He claims that we don't only have one classical intelligence that is being measured with uh, an intelligence test, but that there are more different intelligence. He described eight multiple intelligence. Okay. Now, in um, a 2016 essay, looking back on his uh, life, his scientific life, he acknowledged that one, he never examined this concept. Two, that he thinks it's outdated. And three, that he only used the word intelligence to get it published. I'm now only quoting Howard Gardner himself. But still, Howard Gardner, and this is a quote that I copied, and that's where I think the multiple intelligence way of thinking about things will continue, even if it's outdated, to be useful, even if the science scientific evidence doesn't support it. That's not a scientist talking, that's a guru talking, in my personal opinion, but maybe I'm now not really a scientist. Okay, and even if what people are saying is not too bad, or not bad at all, two examples, here you have Doc Lemmoth, who is not a scientist, who uh, wrote one of the most popular books being used by a lot of teachers around the globe, teach like a champion. Now there's addition, 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 3.0. No, but you also have visible learning by John Hattie. Um, the, the, the funny thing is John Hattie has made a kind of Bible of evidence-based education in 2008, 2009 with the book Visible Learning, which could be regarded as a meta, meta analysis of all what can be done in education. And what he describes actually overlaps with what Doc Lemmoth describes just coming from a different angle. But both books are often being used as a recipe. 
not as something that is based on evidence. Because what does evidence say? This could work. While a recipe tries to suggest, or using it as a recipe, suggests this will work all of the time. But the harsh reality is, in reality, things often get messy. Okay, this was the lamest joke of today, but I think it's fun. Now, imagine if you want to make a brand new teaching session, a brand new lesson. Uh, I'll give you the reference here. Those people have calculated how many options you have for didactical approaches. Two or five trillion options. And they limited their research to the working options. So thinking that there is only one way to approach a, a class, sorry, it's much more complicated than that. So to what I always say to teachers, but um, I think this is something that is the case even in medicine, not everything works and nothing works all of the time. Okay. Now, scientists are human too. Um, to give you an example, just raise your hand because I'm very curious if you recognize this one. Who has ever heard about project follow through? And don't feel stupid if that's not the case. I thought so. Now, imagine, I want to know once and for all what works best in education. And often what we do is then we take a sample and then we will try uh, some stuff with those uh, students um, and calculate everything, but that's boring. No, I've got a better idea. We take all children from, for instance, Belgium, all, all of them in primary education, and we will measure everything and we'll decide that every school has to teach in one distinct way for the next 10 years. So school A will need to teach in this way. School B will need to teach in another way. It's the, a huge randomized control trial using all children as guinea pigs. And afterwards, we have measured everything. Afterwards, we will know for once and for all what works best in education. I want, if you want to do this, I know three things. One, you will never get this through an ethical committee. Two, this will be really expensive. Three, it has been done. Because the study that I just described is a real study and the project was called Project Follow Through. The sample, 352,000 pupils. And it ran from 1967 to 1977. And I've got the results. Yeah, I'm building up the tension a bit, you know. Uh, you have to need you need to tell a story. What are the results? Only one approach worked best, and it's direct instruction. It worked best for reading, math, spelling, and language. Direct instruction is not what we are doing right now. It's not a lecture. It's a very intensive scripted approach. And the way you learned how to read, you know, the phonics method is actually closely related to direct instruction. But maybe now you're thinking, what about well-being? What about problem solving? The results were exactly the same. But it's old. Maybe things have changed. Well, this is PISA 2015. It's, I thought it was interesting to use this data because uh, it's about science communication. And this is about learning science in school, 50 years old for students or uh, pupils from uh, age 15. Now, I'll blow this up in a second, but if you're standing as an element on the left, on the left, then you have a negative correlation. This study doesn't show causal relationship. It, saw, it shows a correlation with worse results for science. If you are on the other side, then you have a positive correlation with learning of science. And what we see here is, for instance, student is a girl, a negative correlation. This shouldn't be the case because, for instance, in Netherlands, it wasn't the case. So it's not by nature. But above this is inquiry-based instruction. 
letting the students discover themselves how science works. And a lot of people will now think, oops, that's the opposite of what I was thinking. Well, I have a source for you, uh, sorry, over there, um, for this oops. And I would uh, advise you to read this uh, source if you're doubting me. And then the OECD recalculated the right column. And what we've seen here is that teacher direct instruction is more effective, but there's something above teacher direct instruction, it's adaptive instruction. And if you combine those two, what you get is actually pretty re resembling direct instruction. But while we have known this for decades, no, really, we've known this for decades. Uh, two years ago, I had the opportunity to have a long talk with Andrea Schleicher, the, the big man behind PISA, from the OECD, uh, who is measuring um, the, the the results of 50-year-olds every three years around the globe. And he said, what we've seen again and again is that teacher-directed instruction is more efficient. But this was dismissed by a lot of scientists. This book here, Constructivist Instruction, Success or Failure, um, by uh, Tobias and Duffy, is a collection of reactions on the article that was mentioned here. And pro and cons, it was the reactions of scientists against the claim, well, the, review, um, the explanation why minimal guidance doesn't work. What we've seen is that we received a paradigm discussion and both sides used studies. And we even saw a strong polarization. And polarization, scientists are human too. While society can polarize, well, scientists sometimes can do too. Just uh, if you ever want to read, not about the reading wars, but the mathematic wars, um, for instance, in the Netherlands, um, it's a torrid story. It's uh, something that Hollywood has forgotten to make a movie about. It's that, well, horror, horrific. And what we often see also in, in fields of science, such as psychology, but also education, is that they are, that they are kind of normative uh, sciences. So also even among scientists, we see a discussion between progressive um, thinkers and scientists versus more traditional. Luckily, most of the time, a good scientists can be more flexible, but still you have another option and that's a more delicate one, is the discussion between effectiveness to be more efficient, more effective and different views on pedagogy, what we want to achieve. And now I have to explain for the people who are um, Anglo-Saxon by background, pedagogy uh, often means something different in the old continent than in the Anglo-Saxon world. Uh, so I have to translate it. Pedagogy here is not intended as a, a synonym for didactics or didactical approach, but more about the more a kind of philosophy about education. What's the purpose of education? And those discussions are important. But what I sometimes see if people are convinced, even scientists, is that people start cherry picking. And I call this then evidence-based cherry picking. If scientists do this, then I have a big problem. But for teachers and schools, people who are working their heads off, they often want recipes because they don't have the time to check everything. And then it's easy to say, oh, I have one study here showing this could be that this could work. Let's do this. Yeah, that's the reason why evidence-based is being transformed to evidence-informed, to make clear for practitioners, be careful. We can inform you about what could work, but you have to be in the know of the context and you have to check if it's the best option for you or not. Now, bringing 
education science and the science of the classroom. Um, there are great attempts. And for the people who are thinking it's too much about education, bear with me for a second because in a few seconds, things will get worse for everybody. Um, for instance, uh, Institute for uh, the Best Evidence in Brief, Robert Slavin started it and it's still going strong. There are a lot of examples like this. Uh, you have the learning scientist, uh, you have the What Works Clearinghouse uh, in the United States, but you have a lot of uh, clearinghouses. Actually, I was asked by the Flemish government to start such a clearinghouse in a way. Uh, you have the Education Endowment Foundation. Great. But this is a study that was published last year. And uh, the scientists, Zeng and colleagues and Cook, they checked the results of 12 educational clearinghouses in the United States. And they checked if what they were claiming based on science overlapped. Because in the best of all worlds, the results of those 12 clearinghouses should have been identical because they are using the same signs, they are using the same questions, they are examining the same stuff, but there was only an overlap of give or take 30%. Now, this wasn't that strange, actually. For instance, if you look at uh, what I just mentioned, the What Works Clearinghouse, if you get your intervention, your study, in the What Works Clearinghouse, it's almost like earning the Nobel Prize for Education because the bar to get included in the What Works Clearinghouse is that high. But different clearinghouses can use different bars, different criteria. And if you use different criteria to include or not to include a study, your results will differ. And the irony is while those clearinghouses want want to make science more accessible, it can make it even more difficult because if you have different clearinghouses sending a different message, which is, like I explained, not that illogic, people can get confused. But there is something even worse. In psychology, now I'm not talking about education, now I'm talking about another uh, field of research. Um, Eric Erickson once said, crisis is an opportunity for growth. And if that's the case, psychology as a science has had a lot of opportunities the past decade. Because since, give or take, 2011, science the psychology has the science of psychology has seen the replication crisis. Uh, just raise your hand who doesn't know what the replication crisis is about in psychology. Okay, that's a lot. Um, for the people who uh, do know, bear with me. Um, but I want to show you. Uh, a hor well, a true horror graph. I want to warn you, one of the next slides will be uh, children not allowed. No, really, it's that, that harsh. And it looks like this. Okay, why is this a horror example? Actually, this is about uh, the question, does sex sell? And the black dots are the original studies. And if you look at the average of the original published studies, then you see, yeah, it has an effect and not a, a bad effect. All the, well, the white triangles are the replication studies. And what you see here is that the average effect in the replication studies are, is close to none. What you he see here is a complete insight of science being demolished. And this has been happening in psychology for quite a while now. For instance, when we were working on our book, um, The Psychology of Great Teaching, we tried to make a summary of what's still standing after the replication crisis. And for instance, uh, in social psychology, we had uh, 
a huge issue because a lot of the major insights were gone. Um, now, what are the causes? What is the reason why this has been happening in psychology? Um, maybe some of you will know Dietrich Stapel, who is famous for being a major fraud. Uh, he made up a lot of his data. Even worse, he gave made up data to his own PhD students without them knowing that it was fake data. So they were doing calculations. They were actually receiving their PhD on fake data without their own knowledge, without knowing that it was fake. But actually, this is not the reason. He is in the list of the top 10 uh, scientists with the biggest amount of retractions, but no. Maybe you've heard about this guy. Uh, this uh, one sink from Cornell University uh, was uh, a scientist in a field of psychology that I, if I had known it existed, I would have studied it. Food psychology. Nobody told me that that existed. It's too many. Um, now, uh, he wrote, it's like I remember the day that it happened, uh, like it was yesterday. He wrote a blog post describing that a new PhD student uh, who came to Cornell University received a task by him. He gave that student a big set of data and the student had to find correlations in the data and write an article on those correlations. Now, actually, that's the opposite of how science work. That's not coming up with a hypothesis and then trying to figure out which data you need to test the hypothesis, then collecting the data after ethical improvement, then uh, data cleaning. That's never shown in, in, in movies, the data cleaning step. Very important, very boring. That's no one knows it. And except a scientist, of course, and then uh, do the statistics and then knowing if it's correct or incorrect. He said, start at the end. Uh, afterwards, um, the replication, um, some people call them the Gestapo, but I call them the heroes. Uh, the replication um, scientists started checking the data of a lot of his studies, and he was a fraud too. But again, that is not the main reason of the replication crisis. They are just little footnotes. Probably this is the main reason. Publication bias. If I do good research and things didn't work out, quite often it was very hard to get it published. And it's not censorship. Quite often it's even the scientists themselves not trying to publish because they know it will be very hard to get it published. And what you then get is, for instance, in this example, that you can see if you look at all the effect sizes that there is something missing in the corner. That's why, for instance, in the meta-meta analysis by John Hattie, that throughout the past 15 years, he published a new version last year, most of the effect sizes started to lower, were diminishing. Because nowadays, for instance, in psychology, we have um, pre-registration, where we pre-register pre-register what we will do. So we can't um, change our plans on cours de route, but also that even if it doesn't get published, that there are traces for people who are working on review studies, but also people working on um, meta-analysis to find traces of unpublished research. Now, if you want to learn much, much more about this, uh, it's not a book written by me, so I can tell you it's a great book by Stuart Ritchie, Science Fictions, because there is much, much more going wrong in science. And for the people who think, yeah, but you know what, psychology, that's just not a good, good uh, niche of science. Actually, I'm, I'm really impressed. I think that the replication crisis is showing that psychology is a true science because they are working on self-correction. By the way, for the people who are thinking, is psychology the worst? Mm, no. Sorry, nope. Um, in the top 10 of Retraction Watch, there is one field of research that is 
most popular. And I hope nobody in this group, in this team, or watching this video needs to have an operation in hospital pretty soon because the field with the biggest amount of retraction studies in the top 10 of retraction watch is anesthetics. Good luck. Okay, moving on. I have to look at the time, but I'm almost there. The good news is things are getting better. Uh, still, things are getting better. This is an overview published. Um, uh, I see that the reference has dropped, but I can give you the reference. They checked the amount of replication studies and educational sciences in top journals of education. And the good news is the amount of replication studies in educational sciences has doubled. Yeah. The bad news is it doubled from 0.1% to, well, 0.15%, sorry, to 0.3% over a course of 10 years. Now, the best way not to have a replication crisis is not doing replication studies. But for me, that's not the best thing to do. Well, I think they should do more application studies. Now, what I do, what do I do knowing all of this? Because um, debunking myths, I'm still doing it. Uh, uh, I'm still fact-checking a lot of claims, but it's sometimes very hard because uh, I have the fear that by doing it, like I explained, some studies have shown that I can actually strengthen the false misconceptions, the false beliefs. But what I do right now is I'm not just trying to debunk something, but also include things that actually are correct, things that are better options. Even sometimes small little changes that people can do to make it more effective. For instance, I make uh, to make this clear, we know that if you want to study, that making a summary is actually not that effective. It doesn't have a negative effect. There are study methods with the negative effect, really. If you use that study method, you know less after studying than before studying. Making a summary doesn't have a negative effect, but on average, it doesn't have a huge effect. So we know it's not that effective. But a lot of people are convinced that they are doing a great job. But if you change just one little thing to this, to making a summary, you can go from not effective to much more effective. And what is the little thing you need to change is if you want to make a summary, first read a chapter or even just a couple of pages of the thing you need to do, summarize, then close your book and try to write down on a sheet of paper what you just read. And then afterwards you reopen the book and check if it's a good summary or not. You might think what's the little difference. Actually, what you then are doing is one of the most effective study methods called retrieval practice. And you st the person still has a summary, still doesn't have to leave the idea of, oh, I really need to make a summary. But at that time, the student is doing something more effective with just a small little change. Okay. This is what I want to share with you. And like I said, it was almost close to an hour, so 50 minutes. And now I want to make the floor yours and try to answer the questions you have. I can't promise that I have an, an answer for every single question, but I'll do my best. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Pedro, also from my side. Uh, feel free, everyone, to drop your questions in the Q&A window or in the chat. Uh, maybe I can start with one myself. Um, so you gave some ideas about how to, to tackle this publication bias, but is there maybe a role for science communicators or scientists themselves that you would highlight or that you would suggest? Yeah, I think as science communicators, I think this development um, is very important and things got worse actually um, uh, during COVID. What we've seen is because we needed to be as fast as possible in a lot of fields of research is that people started working with um, pre-publications and even publications before being reviewed, 
just to speed things up. And for the scientific communication, this was great. But what we often saw was that people um, started just reading the preprints or even the pre peer reviewed uh, prints and taking it for sure for granted. And then as scientific in, in as a science communicator, I think we'll need to teach first journalists, uh, but also a lot of um, a broader audience that in science we have different steps and that we now are go growing in being becoming more transparent. But by becoming more transparent, well, we need to educate also and maybe need to put warning signs on it. This isn't peer reviewed yet. And what does this mean? This is us giving it to you to show you what we're working on, what we think could be the case, but this will be checked. And don't take it for granted right now. It's allowing our colleagues to have information and even try to find flaws in what we've done. Yes, and indeed about the different steps, that's maybe an important side note that, yeah, that should be made when, when results are published, that it's not the finalized end product. Um, maybe I can ask another question. I wrote something down here. Um, yeah, I had the same question for the direct instruction. It's maybe a bit more complex, but can there also be a role for science communication in this? Uh, because we're a little bit further from the education itself, or maybe also for the scientists themselves? Well, for me, what I've seen, um, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about what correction, correct version in English is of a, an old saying. In Dutch, the old saying is, schoenmaker blijf bij u leest. And it's um, what I've seen the past 15 years while doing a lot of uh, work uh, on myth busting and education is, Almost every single person thinks he or she is an expert on education. And uh, I've seen a lot of scientists who are not in the field of uh, education research making huge claims about education. And uh, for instance, um, if, an, if an example, well, I, I wouldn't tell names. That's not a good idea. Uh, th that would be making things worse. And stick to your own field or make clear that you're not talking as a scientist at that moment, but as a person, because um, I think scientists can have their opinion. But there is a, a difference between having an opinion about your own field of expertise and having an opinion on your on another field of expertise. And but people uh, who are listening to you will often not see the difference. And I think that's something that we have to be very careful about. For me, it's the same thing. I I, I receive a lot of emails and questions by journalists, and they are often surprised when I say I don't know, because it's not my field of expertise. And and I know that um, sometimes, well, most journalists actually really appreciate it if you say I don't know, because it makes you also more reliable, mm -hmm. because then they know the other stuff that you are pretty sure about it. Mm -hmm. But I do think as science, com as science communicators or people helping scientists, on the, on, on the one hand, we need to make sure that scientists dare to speak and that they dare to share clear facts, but also distinguish facts from opinion. But also making clear that if it's their field of expertise or not. Quite often what I do is I tell journalists, well, call the scientists because he or she or they are the expert. Mm -hmm. And quite often I get a phone call back from the journalist. They don't want to talk while I know it's their expertise. And that's a pity because you get the chance to explain stuff, be, re be reassured enough to share it with all nuances and ask to read what, uh, you, how you've been quoted afterwards. But if you don't know it, it's as good to say, I don't know it. 
for me, science communication is also all about knowing when to talk and when to say, no, that's not a good idea. So maybe we should also invest a bit more in science communication so that all of these scientists dare to speak up to the journalist when asked a question. Oh, I really hope that would be the case. <laughs> yes. Uh, I think it's also an important nuance that you make that um, indeed when it's not your expertise, you should not speak up. But then what would you suggest if, for example, I'm a scientist, I come across something I know is not true. So it's misconception, but it's not in my field. What is then the suggested thing, action to take? But if, if if you have enough knowledge and if you, for instance, if you recognize uh, an often made mistake between correlation and causal relationship, um, sorry, but as a scientist, as a whole, you should be able to recognize this uh, and then you can point this out. Uh, if you know the references, if you know the research on this, first of all, you can ask it's nothing wrong with ask before you claim this is incorrect you can um also ask what about this do you mean this or is it misrepresented uh when i started as a mythbuster and fact checking uh maybe i was a bit too activistic myself and i um often shared it immediately on social media but i learned the hard way that sometimes certain claims are or misrepresented in the text that the person actually didn't say it that way or it was misunderstanding and quite often the first thing that i do is check with the person themselves what was the intention how do you mean it and uh what is the basis for this claim what mm -hmm. a lot of fact checkers do normally also um, and I think that's also crucial because um, people can make mistakes, but in the whole process of bringing information to uh, an audience, if a person is writing their own on their own blog, then it's the direct way. If they are writing it on social media themselves, then it's the direct way. But quite often there are different steps between the scientist and the audience and then things can go wrong by yeah. accident. I understand. Okay, if there's no further questions, I guess that everything was very clear and people have a lot to, to think about. Also, you gave a lot of interesting references. Um, you can find them again in the replay that we will put on our YouTube channel. Um, and I will link also the blog of Pedro in our follow-up mail so you can follow all of his other work and his interesting insights there. And then I hope to see all of you in one of our next talks. Uh, and thank you again, Pedro, for being here today and helping us. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.